Welcome to DLS's student webinar series. In today's webinar, we'll be talking about preparing for the OPI. In this webinar, we'll start off with an overview of OPIs. The reason we are saying OPIs and not the OPI is because each OPI, each oral proficiency interview, is different based on the agency that administers it. So we'll look at the general points among these OPIs. Then we'll talk about expectations at each proficiency level and tips for reaching your target proficiency level. Finally, we'll wrap up with the frequently asked question sections. We'll start off with a section on understanding OPIs. Here we'll look at the basics, the structure of an OPI, and talk about level checks and level probes. So the basics. An OPI is usually held over the phone. It's one-on-one. -on -one. The time varies. Many OPIs last around half an hour, but some may take up to an hour and a half. An OPI is recorded and it is interactive and adaptive. We'll talk a bit more about what this means later. And then, as we said previously, tests differ based on the agency that administers them. However, all tests have the same goal, and that is to elicit a rateable speaking sample from the test taker. So here's the basic structure of an OPI. An OPI will start with a warm up, which is just a simple chat uh, between the tester and the test taker with the purpose of getting started to speak in the target language, warming up, and just getting the tester to relax. Um, however, during the warm up, the examiner is going to form an initial hypothesis about your level. Then, after the examiner makes his or her first guess about your level, they're going to move into a level check. And a level check is, uh, the goal of a level check is to see what you can do in the target language. And the purpose is to see what level you can sustain within the target language. And of course, when we talk about levels here, we're referring to the ILR levels of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Um, so the tester wants to see what level of communication you can sustain, what your highest baseline is, where you can complete all of the functions within that level. And in addition to that, the tester also wants to see what your limit is, what your ceiling is. And this is the purpose of a level probe. So let's say the tester believes that you are a level two. They want to check and make sure you're not a higher level, a level three. So in order to do that, they will push you and see if you can do level three tasks. And the goal of a level probe is to see where your communication breaks down. And a break in communication can mean a few different things and can look like a few different things. It might be that the tester has a sudden loss in fluency. Uh, maybe they start stumbling over their words, they have to pause or hesitate. Um, or it might mean a significant decrease in accuracy. Maybe you start making a lot of grammar mistakes um, or something like that. Uh, or it might just mean that you either don't or can't uh, answer the tester's questions or complete the function that they're asking you to do. So that's the purpose of a level probe. It's to basically see what your ceiling is, uh, what you can't do in the target language. Um, and then the cycle of level checks and level probes is repeated several times in an OPI. Um, and checks and probes may include role plays. And then the final piece is the wind down. And this is where the tester returns to a level that you are comfortable with, and they wrap up and conclude the test. So here is an example. Um, of an OPI for a level two student. You can see that during the warm up, the tester starts off at level one, which is generally true for OPIs. The tester will usually start out at a level one. 
and then we'll go up or down from there. And it looks like during this OPI, the tester pretty quickly got the idea that the student was a level two, and so moved into a check for level two, uh, a probe for level three, but it looks like the student couldn't sustain the level three, so then went back to a, a check for level two, another probe for three, check for two, and then back into a wind down, where the tester returned to a level that the student was comfortable with. Um, so this student is a level two, and we see that the probes, uh, they're just kind of peaks there. The student really couldn't sustain communication at that level. Um, but in some cases, uh, if a student handles a probe very well, then the tester will reconsider their initial hypothesis about the student level. And in that case, they will move into a different set of checks and probes. So if, for example, this student had handled the level three probes very well, then the tester would move into checking for level three and probing for level four. And now, as we're talking about level checks and level probes, you might be wondering what those look like specifically. And in this section, we'll answer that question. We're going to talk about what the tester is looking for at each proficiency level. And essentially, the, the tester is looking for two things. What can you do in the target language? Or what is your functional ability? And how well can you do it? So the first thing the tester wants to see is what you can do in the target language. And they're looking for your functional ability. Each ILR level has expectations of different linguistic functions. So in order to be at a certain ILR level, you have to be able to complete all of the linguistic functions within that level. So when the tester is completing the level checks and level probes, they are checking and probing for each of these linguistic functions. And you can imagine how they might check for each of these functions. For example, if the tester wants to see whether you can narrate in the past, they might ask you a question like, oh, you mentioned that you enjoy skiing. Can you tell me about the last ski trip that you went on? And by asking this question, the tester is looking to see if you can narrate in the past. In addition to testing to see what you can do, the tester is also looking at how well you can do it. And what they're looking for is text type, accuracy, fluency, and vocabulary. When we say text type, we mean the type of language that the speaker is producing. So for a level zero or zero plus really, uh, the student is only expected to say words, phrases, or maybe a list. At level one, however, the student is expected to speak in complete sentences. In level two, the student should be able to speak at paragraph level. And then at level three, the expectation is that the student will be able to speak extend, in extended discourse or multi-paragraphs. Accuracy, of course, refers to correct grammar, correct pronunciation. Fluency is the ease with which you speak, how many pauses you have, um, how easily or how quickly you're able to speak. And then of course vocabulary refers to how correct your vocabulary is and the range of vocabulary that you have. And now let's get to the particularly interesting stuff, test taking strategies and tips. We'll talk about reaching your specific proficiency goals and then general test taking strategies. So if your target proficiency is a level one, here's some tips for you. The first tip is to pay attention to your text type. And this is something that the tester will be specifically looking for. So you want to be sure to speak in sentences, not just words or phrases. And sometimes this can be a bit trickier than we expect. In real life, uh, if someone asks us how we're doing, we might just say, fine. But in the OPI, 
you should speak in complete sentences and add detail as much as you can. You also want to be aware of all of the level one functions and make sure that you can fulfill all of them. So for level one, for example, uh, some students may be very practiced and familiar with answering questions, but they might not be as familiar with asking questions. This is something that you will have to do on the OPI, however. The tester will ask you to ask them some questions. And then finally, make sure that you can do everything that you need to do in the target language. So at a level one, you might need to ask for help or do something to kind of verify or check your understanding. And those are just going to be simple questions like, can you repeat that? Can you slow down? Or checking understanding by saying, oh, did you mean this or this? If your target proficiency is level two, again, you want to pay attention to your text type. So the tester will be checking to see if you can speak at paragraph, at paragraph level. And when they say paragraph level, they don't mean just uh, several sentences together. What they really mean are connected sentences. And that means that you need to be able to use connectors and time indicators. Um, and this will allow you to knit your sentences together into a cohesive paragraph. So when we say connectors, we just mean words like uh, first this happened and then this after that, finally, etc. Or connectors, another example of connectors might be words that show cause and effect. Oh, because someone did this, then I did this or whatever you need to do to make your sentences connected and to make your paragraph, uh, your speech cohesive. And then another really important point for level two is to provide as much detail as possible in your answers. So you really want to be sure to not give short answers. Um, Again, the tester is looking to see if you can complete specific functions in your target language. So you want to demonstrate as much as you can that you are able to fulfill those functions. Um, and don't worry about talking for too long. Uh, the tester will always feel free to interrupt you. And being interrupted is not a bad sign. It just means that the tester has gotten enough information uh, to see whether or not you can complete that function. So don't give short answers, provide as much detail as possible, and really give long, full, complete answers. Now, if your target proficiency is level three, then it's particularly important to make sure that you are listening closely to the tester's questions and answering them fully. So as we've said several times, the tester is looking to see if you can complete the specific level three functions. So for example, if the tester asks your opinion about a current event and you respond with facts, that's not uh, completing the function because you're giving factual information and that's a level two function. So it's really important to listen very closely to the tester's question and then answer that question. So if they ask your opinion, then you need to make sure to share your opinion, giving supporting it with facts, but giving your opinion. And then another very important function at level three is the ability to speculate or hypothesize. This is something that the tester will definitely be checking for at level three. And you want to demonstrate that you can fully complete this function. So if the tester asks you a question that requires speculation or hypothesis, then be sure to use hypothetical structures throughout your answer. So don't just use one hypothetical structure and then continue talking about the topic, but really show in your answer that you have control over that function and over the structures that go with it. 
Now let's talk about some general advice that apply to you regardless of what your target proficiency level is. So the first and most important is stay in the target language throughout your interview. Um, this means that everything really should be in the target language. Um, and this includes the little words like filler words we use or any clarification words uh, or questions that you need to ask. And when we say filler words, we mean those empty words that you use to fill pauses when you're thinking. So in English, uh, filler words are things like, um, uh, well, like, and things like that. So even those small words or sounds, really, those should be in the target language. Each language has its own array of filler words. Make sure that you know what those are in your target language and that you use them in the OPI. And if you don't know a specific word or phrase, um, that happens to all of us. And of course, it's not pleasant if it, when it happens during a speaking test, but be be sure that you are able to circumlocute. And circumlocution is where you use, you explain uh, when you can't remember the word for something. So let's say I'm in a speaking exam and I have forgotten the word for can opener. So I'll just say, oh, you know, that thing you use to uh, open cans, uh, to open things, uh, it's, it's silver and you, you turn it and, and then you can open things. And that's circumlocution. Um, usually there are specific phrases that uh, we use to circumlocute. So in English, some of those phrases might be the thing that the person who, um, the place where, or we might have some descriptive phrases to say what it looks like. Uh, so make sure that you have done that a little bit in your target language so that you have some practice in it and that you have the phrases and the language that you need to be able to do that. Uh, and then some more general advice. Uh, we've talked about this already for levels two and three, but it really does apply to all levels, whatever your proficiency goal is, is to provide as much detail as you can. So even if your proficiency goal is a level one, uh, try not to give short answers. Uh, provide as much detail as you can according to whatever your, the limits of your language are. Um, now, during the warm up, as we mentioned earlier, the tester is going to start out at a level one, form an initial guess about your level, and then go up or down from there. So, of course, you want them to immediately see that you're at a higher level uh, if you are aiming for a two or a three. Uh, so, don't be afraid to really use all of your language in that warm up. Um, don't be afraid to use structures or functions that are a higher level if you have the opportunity to do so naturally in a way that is natural. And then also within the OPI, don't be afraid to self-correct. So if you hear yourself making an error and you know you've made a mistake, don't be afraid to correct yourself within the OPI because what that does is it shows the tester that you know the correct structure and that it's not a pattern of error. Um, so, so definitely don't be afraid to correct yourself if you hear yourself making a few mistakes, but do have, have a balance. So you don't want to go into the OPI and keep pausing yourself and correcting yourself constantly because then your fluency will, will go down. So if you hear yourself make you know, a, a few errors, you know, one or two or three, go ahead and correct those. But, um, but keep in mind that you also want to keep your fluency high. And then here are some tips and strategies for the day that you have your test. Now, we mentioned that every OPI starts with a warm up, but it's a really good idea to warm up in the target language before you take the test. So a couple of hours before your OPI is scheduled, uh, take some time to do something in your target language, um, whether it's speaking, reading, listening, or what have you. Um, it might be something like 
going to a few target language news websites, reading the headlines, reading a few stories, maybe listening to some news or watching a TV program or a film in your target language uh, if you're at that level. Um, or it might be something like speaking, maybe talking to yourself. That's really valuable. Um, or you can ask your teacher maybe to do, you know, just a one hour chat or something like that with you. Um, and this will help you just get your brain switched over to the target language so that you can really stra start off on a strong note once your OPI starts. Um, and then just a word of caution, uh, as we said, most OPIs are conducted over the phone. Be careful to not use a dictionary or a translator. Uh, if the tester is able to detect that you're using one of these devices, then your test will be canceled. And then just a few general reminders here. Um, if a tester brings up a topic that you are uncomfortable with for some reason, for example, if something is personally uncomfortable for you to talk about, maybe something related to family or an experience that you've had, then definitely feel free to ask them to change the topic. Um, testers are used to uh, pivoting from topic to topic, and they're trained to be able to do this. Um, so definitely be aware that you are totally uh, completely have freedom to do that and make sure that you're prepared to explain that you're uncomfortable with the topic and then ask for a change within the target language. So make sure that you have the language to say, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm really not comfortable discussing this topic for personal reasons. Is it okay if we change to a different topic? Make sure you can say that in the target language. And then also be aware that there are occasions where testers make mistakes. Um, so if you feel that something inappropriate happened during your test or that the tester made a mistake or did something that you think was not was not appropriate or was not accurate, um, then report it. Go ahead and report it to your agency uh, ASAP as soon as possible and definitely before you get your score. Now let's look at some frequently asked questions and a few final helpful hints. So the first question, uh, the student whose goal is a level two, that's a great question. So to reach a proficiency level, you must be able to fulfill all of the functions for that level. And one of the functions for level two is narration in the past. So you need to show that you can do this. And the bottom line is, yes, you need to have control over the basic tenses in order to narrate in the past. But keep in mind that the tester is not just looking for tenses. They are also looking at your total ability to narrate in the past. And that includes things like time words. For example, a long time ago when I was a child, last year, etc., as well as tenses. Another thing to keep in mind here is that when you talk about mistakes with verb tenses, there are different kind of mistakes. So one difference we want to highlight here is the difference between a pattern of error and a slip. So a pattern of error is when someone makes repeated mistakes with a specific structure. And if this is the case, then what this says to the tester is that that person does not have control over that structure and therefore can't really complete the function. Now a slip on the other hand, is when someone makes an occasional error and then they can correct it. And that just shows you that they know that person knows the rule and they mostly have control, but they, they made a, a small mistake that they know was a mistake. So that's quite a different error. So if you have um, a situation where you occasionally make a slip, but you can correct it, that's very different from a pattern of error, which shows that you don't control, have control over that function. This is a great question. Keep in mind that pretty much anything is fair game for a tester to ask about, including current events. So the tester might ask you, for example, about an ongoing event or crisis that you simply don't know much about. In this case, it's fine to say that you don't know, but as we mentioned earlier, avoid giving a short answer. 
So don't just give a short answer of, I don't know about that topic. Instead, say something like, oh, wow, that's a great topic. The truth is, I don't, very know, I don't know very much about that. I know that the last thing I read in the news was XYZ, and the other day I heard my colleague mention QRX, etc., etc. Um, so this is what we often do in our first language when we don't know about a topic. Uh, we might not have a much, a much information, but we can still talk about it, even if we're just repeating something that we've heard. Um, so that's exactly what you what you can also do in the OPI. And this is a way to show your command of the language, even if you lack knowledge in a specific area. Question number three. This is a really good point and is something that can often catch students off guard. The best way to prepare for this, of course, is to practice. Um, if you are currently taking a class, ask your teacher to help you prepare for the OPI by turning off the video during your Zoom sessions or by having uh, a practice OPI over the phone rather than having your regular class through Zoom. If you are not in a class right now, um, it might be a good idea to request a few tutorial sessions with a teacher and then do those sessions over the phone then this can get you used to speaking over the phone in your target language. For question number four, there are a lot of good ways to warm up. Basically, anything you do in the target language will help get you ready. Um, if you're at a higher level, some good options are watching a TV show, reading the news, listening to a target language podcast or a news segment, or maybe even reading a book or flipping through a magazine. If you're at a lower level, uh, then again, doing similar things, maybe reading something from a graded news site, uh, maybe reading just the headlines uh, in a target language news site. Another really good option here is speaking aloud. Um, this is a great way to just get your brain switched on and get, get yourself kind of in used to speaking the target language. If it has been some time since you finished language training, uh, it's a great idea to start this process several days before your OPI, even a week or two ahead of time. And this will really give you uh, some time to get back into the target language and kind of remember all of the things that you may have forgotten. Um, if it's been quite a while since you finished language training, it's also a great idea to book a few sessions with the teacher. Um, and this can just be an opportunity for you to talk with the teacher, discuss current events, make sure you're at your best when it comes to your OPI day. This is a great question, and we really didn't touch on the plus levels in this webinar. So remember that in order to be at a certain proficiency level, you must be able to perform 100% of the functions for that level. So for example, if you can perform almost all of the level three functions, but there is one function that you can't perform or you can't sustain communication for that function, then you cannot be rated at a level three. However, uh, let's say that you can perform all of the tasks, all of the functions at one level and you can perform the tasks at the next level, but not consistently, maybe between 66 and 99% of the time, then in that case, you would be likely to get a plus level. And then finally, a few helpful hints as we conclude. Um, if you want, we mentioned at the beginning of this webinar that the OPI is an adaptive test. And one way this manifests is in the first point here. If you mention something in the test, um, so let's say during the warm up, for example, you mentioned that you like basketball, or you talk about your children, or you bring up a vacation that you went on in Thailand, then it is very likely that you will be asked to talk about it. So the tester will very likely 
seize on that, uh, grab that topic, and ask you to expand on it later in the test. So they might say something like, oh, uh, you mentioned your vacation to Thailand. Uh, can you please tell me about it? And that might, might be their check or their probe for past narration. Um, or they might say, oh, you know, you mentioned that you play basketball. Can you explain the rules of basketball or something like that? Um, so knowing this, um, any, knowing that any topics you bring up in the warm up are likely to uh, be brought up by the tester later in the test, um, be thoughtful and be selective about what you discuss in the warm up. Um, so be prepared uh, to any with anything that you bring up in the warm up. Um, only bring up things that you <laughs> want to talk about or are prepared to talk about um, later in the exam. And this can kind of help you uh, direct the exam a little bit in topics that you are really confident in talking in and comfortable talking in. Um, just one word of caution, of course, uh, you don't want to try to include any memorized or rehearsed material. Um, so if the tester, testers are trained to look out for memorized material, and if they detect that you are speaking from a script that you've memorized, they will try to deconstruct that as much as possible. So they'll ask you a bunch of questions, they'll redirect you to kind of try to break you out of that memorized script. So definitely bring up topics that you feel comfortable talking about, but do not include anything that you've memorized or anything like that. Many of the materials uh, that we used to create this webinar are available online. Uh, and it can be really helpful to peruse these sources at your leisure in order to help you get a better understanding of uh, the linguistic functions and what's expected at each level. So here are the references we used. Uh, feel free to check them out as you have time.